how we can apply the blockchain and blockchain technology to the asset management industry. Um, so by definition, asset managements are backed by assets. Um, so asset-backed tokens are really the instruments that we're looking to, uh, we're exploring uh, to develop and to issue. Um, so we're in the process of issuing our first asset-backed token, um, and um, the, I think the applications are quite interesting. Um, just a, a quick you know, um, a helicopter view on asset-backed tokens. Um, of the total market capitalization of, um, of the, the crypto um, universe, uh, a very small portion are asset-backed tokens, and it's dominated by a token called Tether, which is uh, uh, backed by the US dollar, uh, which has about a two and a half billion dollar market cap uh, compared to Bitcoin, which is about 150 billion. Um, so I think the potential for asset backed tokens is actually very large. Uh, that's great. And uh, yes, talking about uh, this new type of token, asset backed tokens, and also utility tokens and security tokens, uh, what do you think uh, are there going to be any new regulations uh, on, the, on this new type of tokens? And are they going to be even more like strict in, uh, like, uh, than the current regulations for security tokens? Um, yeah, well, it's, um, it's a bit untested territory at the moment. Uh, Tether, for example, is not regulated by any specific regulators, um, but you can clearly see that um, the uh, issues that are surrounding uh, the, the current asset-backed tokens, like ver verification that there are actually assets behind it, I think Tether has had um, quite a bit of uh, press about whether or not it's actually backed by dollars and where those dollars are held. So I think regulation uh, is inevitable uh, for this industry. The question is uh, really how much and when it will come. Thank you. Darren, I know you've been an advisor to several projects. Uh, can you tell about a little bit more about your attitude to utility tokens and security tokens, what you have advised to these projects and why? Uh, okay, uh, well, th thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, yes, uh, I, I advised uh, a number of um, uh, ICOs. Um, some of them have, uh, have already happened, such as MicroMoney. Some are still in the making, such as Serial, or brain patch, um, and uh, it, it is a constant struggle. You know, uh, you, you need to uh, really understand uh, which way to go to. And uh, you know, some people like uh, Gordon Einstein, they strongly argue that you know you have to go for security uh, tokens, and you know, let's forget about uh, utility tokens altogether. I, I, I think that. Um, that's probably premature uh, death <laughs> for, for, for uh, um, utility tokens. In fact, uh, one of the projects that uh, I'm advising at the moment, uh, based out of uh, Moscow, um, uh, which, which is trying to um, tokenize um, real estate, is trying to do it in a very, very peculiar way, and is trying to, to, to do it via uh, IP rights tokens rather than security tokens or utility tokens. So it's, uh, we, we can actually see that there is a development of new um, innovative ways of uh, uh, tokenizing uh, anything, for that matter. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a very clever way, because if you go for a different uh, um, sphere of law, um, I'm a lawyer by, by background, and uh, you know, that, that, that is always fascinating for, uh, to discuss this uh, with fellow lawyers that uh, if the sphere is different, then uh, it's not subject for SEC regulation because uh, intellectual property is a completely different field. Uh, and it is still a property, so it's all about ownership, but it's just regulated in a very different way. Yep, uh, I, would, I would very much agree it's a very interesting uh, area. What uh, we've seen happening in the space, it's, it's uh, something quite ugly. If you think, um, who, who uh, profits most from uh, companies choosing the securities route are obviously securities lawyers and compliance consultants and so on. So there's quite a bit of, of pressure there for them to uh, not even look at uh, a company's token, but just push them into securities uh, territory and say, you need to do legal, ICO need to to be compliant and uh, usually that goes along with all sorts of fear mongering uh, and it's something very unethical uh, we believe. 
<clears throat> especially if it's not necessary in in most cases the vast majority of cases um, you are the best thing you and safest thing you can do is to exclude us and now also uh, canada and that's what we uh, typically advise our clients to do also if you say securities it's always in respect to certain jurisdiction again uh, in respect uh, to us and, uh, and very few other jurisdictions and us is really uh, the only one that that has uh, teeth and can really enforce things on a, on a regular level. I mean, China or uh, others, they don't have the, the power to to enforce things. Jay, can I ask you a question? I'm sorry, uh, uh, Sandra. Um, you, you, you say that you advise your clients to, to strongly not to go US way, but that's uh, one of the largest, if not the largest market out there. Um, there's, you know, the, the crypto holding community uh, of US is, is huge. Uh, and therefore, you know, if you automatically exclude yourself from that market, that means obviously that your hard cap, your soft cap is going to be much smaller. So wh why this advice? Maybe it's uh, easier to go to uh, Securities Commission and, you know, uh -huh. secu secure your uh, okay from them and, and, you know, to go that way. And the costs are not prohibitive. I would actually argue otherwise. Um, the, the token space is still a crypto investor's world. So if you, if you have any, uh, any uh, restrictions on your offerings, on, on participants, and that depends, they are, uh, you can either distinguish between US and non-US participants very early on, uh, the SEC requires to do, to take to make, take reasonable efforts, which means IP address blocking and checkbox acknowledgement form. Um, that's one thing, but if you, if you um, uh, create barriers to entries, and KYC is the main one, because that's, again, that keeps the big crypto investors uh, away, which are, we still account for, for around 90% of, of funding in the space, that, that hits you uh, very badly. So I would argue, argue otherwise. Plus, there is another option you can do if you really want to capture the, the few uh, US accredited investors, which is a very small sliver of, of uh, funding, then you can do a dual offering, which means a regulated and unregulated ICO. Just make sure you don't have any spillover effects in terms of compliance requirements onto the unregulated side of things. Uh, thank you, and I have a question to Rokas uh, about basically the same matter. Uh, as we all had like a year ago, or a month ago, sorry, SSC claimed that uh, they don't believe that there are any utility tokens at all because like all the tokens are securities and they have to be securities. Do you think uh, it's going to uh, influence somehow the European regulation? regulations and uh, what would be the consequences of basically uh, this statement. <laughs> okay, so thank you for the question. I would like to take one step back. And uh, so ICOs was a very interesting and superior way to raise capital. Even if you look at, let's say, the Baltic countries, Estonia or Lithuania, Let's see, these countries, Lithuania managed to attract a lot of money. Let's see, uh, the amounts of money that have been unseen to us before. So, for example, during last year, our startups managed to attract 400 million euros in capital. This is four times more than through entire history of venture capital. Yeah, so in one year, four times more than entire history of venture capital. So we are able, via ICOs, to raise a lot of money. And this is sort of, let's say, on one hand, this is a good sign, let's say, for the economist. But on the other side, it creates a lot of problems. Because when teams raise that much money, some of the projects are not that good. And when teams, they raise 20 million, 30 million, or 40 million, they sort of believe that they are gods, and they start acting irresponsibly with that money. And this is a problem, yeah? So this is a problem even, let's say, I do not, let's say, see objection, uh, let's say, of utility tokens. I, I, I think in some instances they are actually preferable to security tokens, but what we need to make sure, it doesn't matter whether it is utility token or security token, we need to make sure that the teams who raise funds they act responsibly. Yeah, that would be the key thesis because we see many, many teams who are not acting responsibly, and that is a problem. <laughs> Thank you. 
One way to do that is really to, to keep the funds in a, in a multi-sig uh, uh, wallet and then have an independent company like a foundation verify the milestones uh, and then release small amounts of, the, of what they raised for their operations as actually needed. That's a good idea for a startup right there. What? That's a good idea for a startup right there. I mean, that's right how, how you probably uh, do a token uh, offering. That's how it's probably done. Unfortunately, or maybe, or maybe in reality, do, or maybe do it under the Ethereum Foundation or something like that. Well, it's unfortunately in reality, people are even raising outside of smart contracts, which, in my in my opinion, is not even a, a token offering. Uh, that's not even a, like in the classical sense. If you just raise in a regular wallet, because uh, you have the the owner has full control over it, he can just take off with your funds. The purpose of smart contracts is to create this this uh, trustless environment and escrow functionality. That's what's really all about. I think Vitalik was saying about this new way of conducting ICOs in exactly those terms. You have to do it in stages and release capital to the exactly. teams uh, when they reach certain milestones. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so basically you're saying that uh, there have to be some sort of additional, uh, I won't call it regulation, but some, some sort of additional processes for the team who conducted ICO and uh, some rules that will be like regulating their management, their behavior and so on. Uh, but uh, what about like the essence of cryptocurrencies? I mean, the cryptocurrencies from the very beginning were created as something decentralized, something which is not regulated to, by any government belonging to any country and so on. And during the last year, as we see, the picture is changing completely. So uh, isn't it some sort of paradox? Uh, I, I don't think so. What, what we are seeing is, uh, First of all, business always follows the path of least resistance. So now we are seeing a competition between jurisdictions, between countries for business, which is a good thing. And uh, it's already in the US where regulation is really uh, bank driven. These are the regulators in the US are ex bank people, they're bank lobbied, uh, bank paid, I shouldn't say bribed, but that's really what it boils down to. Uh, they, even they are starting to now backing off a little bit. Uh, what we are seeing is uh, a bifurcation into two universes, generally speaking in terms of uh, regulation, a regulated universe and an unregulated universe. Unregulated one will be sensor resistant, decentralized systems, DAO-like uh, uh, structures, decentralized businesses, unincorporated businesses, and uh, quite often that goes head in head with uh, pseudonymous teams, with trust ratings, web of trust. So that's the next generation of structures we'll see after uh, ICO. So the DAO is gonna be back as a DICO and various other uh, forms, that's what I predict. Okay, do I have to add something? Do, do I have something to add? <laughs> no, no, I think, I think it's up to right, but I think the, um, the level of regulation um, will depend also on the nature of, uh, of the token. And at the moment we see a lot of, um, of what have effectively economically are security tokens being issued as uh, utility tokens, um, just to bypass the need for regulation. And we see that in Singapore, where we're based, um, and so that's quite common. I think uh, we can anticipate a greater degree of regulation going forward, uh, and certainly coming from uh, and looking at the asset-backed token uh, world, where we are familiar with the regulations that asset managers are subject to, um, I think it's, it's, um, uh, it behooves us to, um, to approach um, the, the whole process with the expectation that at some point we will be, uh, need to be regulated. Yeah. That's the, the regulated world I was talking about. It's one of the two universes, exactly. <coughs> I think we will see a lot of uh, self-regulation. Um, I think that uh, eventually, maybe, I don't know, maybe within this year or next year, we will see a lot of uh, ICOs that have done it already, uh, maybe for, form some sort of uh, self-regulatory body and that any new ICOs that will be coming into the market uh, will have to adhere to certain rules uh, to be um, appealing to the investor community. Um, and I think also that because uh, there are more and more platforms that help launch ICOs, those platforms will effectively also uh, work as some sort of uh, threshold mechanism uh, of self-regulation um, that will try to weed out you know, the obvious scam and things like that.
uh, yeah, going back to regulations again, because yes, we kind of on this topic. Uh, as far as you know, yesterday SSC started the massive, I don't know, attack on all the ICOs. It, it was the NASA, which is uh, the yeah. North Atlantic Securities uh, yeah. Administrator, which is together SEC and the Canadian counterpart, which yeah. is very, again, bank, bank lobbied, uh, uh, bank paid efforts to also, if you look at the language they are using, there were a couple scams in there, but the rest uh, of them, uh, I was not very justified in my opinion. It was, a, it's a, we are looking at, at a very broad uh, and excessive over regulation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I talked to several pro projects today, like, in, and they all received these letters, including us, basically, we also received it from... Some of our clients. Yes, yeah. yes, 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 something. <laughs> and uh, I'm really interested what's going to happen next. I mean, uh, is uh, this, like, this sort of war with ICOs going to change, like, yeah, the, the whole picture? Are uh, there going to be a lot of trials and, and so on? It's going to get ugly. It's going to get a real battlefield. And uh, what we are seeing with new uh, token offerings that are now coming out, the vast majority simply excludes US and for good reason. Yes, yeah. y yes, they do, but still, uh, even if you exclude the US, you know, you can't get rid of US because US is coming and saying, like, hello, here we are. Well, it depends. It does. <laughs> you have to distinguish where you are incorporated and where you are offering your tokens. Yeah, absolutely. It's two different absolutely. things. Yes. So the US, of course, if you offer them to US uh, participants, then they can come after you. Yeah. So yeah. that's why I'm saying uh, you want to exclude US participants and then yes. you are perfectly fine. Yeah. Because for, for pure utilities offerings, which they are justified once, uh, the SEC has raised raise the bar, and it's just, uh, even if you have natural, clear natural demonstrable utility, it's unfortunately too dangerous. Yeah, absolutely, I agree with you. <coughs> uh, anything to add? Well, maybe I would like to follow up on my previous thought that I said, yes, actually, I think we need to have an environment where we have more protection uh, regarding investors, that sort of the founders, of the, you know, the, the project founders act more responsibly with money. Yeah? So this is, let's say, maybe the fundamental thesis that I believe. Now, the thesis that many people argue that, yes, utility tokens are dead, that we, we need to move to security tokens in order to protect investors. I don't necessarily believe that that is the only way. There are certain instances where utility tokens make more sense than security tokens. Um, let me explain what I mean. So what is the value of a security token? So let's say when you invest in a project is a security. So you get like a part of the profit, uh, 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 let's say, for the project. So if the company is profitable, your shares, will, I mean, you will, be get, you will be getting dividends, so your shares will be uh, uh, getting, you know, profitable and valuable, yeah? So in order for security token to be valuable, your business needs to generate profit. Now, it's very interesting that with utility tokens, sometimes you can establish a not-for-profit charge zero fees, so you, you can have an industry or a company that has a big turnover but zero profit. If you had a security token, that the value of that company would be zero because zero profits more or less results in zero equity value. But in terms of a utility token, if you create an application-specific payment, if you have a business that has a lot of turnover, a lot of revenue but zero profit, utility token will have some value by that formula that we sort of saw today by, uh, by Henry 1 and Henry 2, basically MV is equal to PT. So even, let's say, if you have a company that has a lot of revenue with zero profit, utility token will become valuable. If you moved to security tokens, zero profit means zero equity value, so investors will not invest. So some specific instances where utility tokens make sense versus security, but in both instances, we need to make sure that whenever founder is, is doing a utility token or security token, they need to act responsibly with the money and actually be working towards you know, achieving project goals. Uh, so two points to that. Uh, one point is that uh, monetization works very different in a token model. So they are, you don't have equity, you don't have dividends, and that's really what it's, uh, uh, it's about and should be about. Otherwise, uh, why, why do a token offering? So that's one thing. The second thing is if, if you say investors, you always have to keep in mind that there are two large classes of investors, which are the ones uh, 
typically institutional guys that want to, to invest the, the traditional way, and the other ones is the crypto investors, which is a bunch of from, from small uh, uh, crypto enthusiasts to, to some of the whales, to some of the now uh, uh, crypto businesses that are really quite profitable. So for those, it's a, it's a very different, um, a, a very different uh, criteria that they are applying when they decide uh, whether to invest or not, or to participate or not, I shall say, in, in a token offering. And also the, the value of a utility token, obviously, is in the utility of the token, like access to the platform, all, all these uh, features. So it's, it's something uh, to keep in mind. And uh, if, you, if you have a securities token and there are, there are, uh, you're erecting uh, barriers to entry, which again, specifically KYC, it's a, the crypto community, and I, I'm one of the early uh, uh, Bitcoin uh, uh, enthusiasts. I joined the space in, in 2010. Um, it's very privacy conscious, generally. That's so some of the, the ethos of the community. It's also a, very, a community that's about decentralization. So there, uh, KYC, it's off the table. It really, uh, just from a philosophical uh, Ato's point of view, it's against the spirit of the community, and and uh, that's that's a constraint right there. And it it's, it's results in a severely reduced funding. You can do the statistics, we've done it, that uh, if you look at the average funds raised, if you have a KYC offering, yes, you may get some more from the institutional guys, but it's still very few um, who, A, would be accredited investors or institutional money flowing in compared to the uh, vast majority of funding in the token space that's crypto money. I, th I, th I think there's, a, sorry. Yeah, I think that there are a couple of things to consider, right? And KYC is relevant um, when you're coming into crypto, when you're coming out. Um, so when you're moving from fiat, fiat yeah, if you uh, into crypto yeah. or, or crypto uh, out then to yes, fiat, yes. then um, KYC is relevant. Um, at the moment, KYC is not so relevant when you're trading uh, uh, on exchanges, although that's changing. What is relevant, however, um, is um, tax. Uh, any jurisdiction that has capital gains tax, um, in theory, you should self-declare, um, and you will apply capital, and uh, capital gains tax will be applied to you. Um, so that's uh, another form of, um, of KYC, self-declared, um, that you have to report to your, your tax department. And it's very interesting that a lot of the volatility and um, downward movement in Bitcoin in the first quarter was associated with U.S. taxpayers on the run-up to April 15th, realizing that um, they had a large capital gain from 2017, and because of the fall in the value of Bitcoin uh, in the first quarter, they didn't have enough money to pay that tax bill. Um, so uh, I think what we'll see increasingly is not just KYC, but also tax considerations come into uh, the market dynamics of cryptocurrencies. Sure, that, I mean, that's one aspect. Uh, the other one is we have to keep in mind that uh, GDPR is in effect, and there you can't even do KYC on anything. You can. It, you can only do it on what's what's called regulated uses, which means where you're touching fiat or you're touching security anywhere where you're only raising in coins, where you do coin-to-coin -coin exchange. It's unregulated use, which makes uh, uh, any um, aggregation or processing of data on EU residents illegal, right? So it's many people, there are many consultants, wannabe consultants out there and wannabe lawyers uh, pushing KYC because they can, they can fleece people uh, where it's not just unnecessary, but it's, it's illegal. Plus, it's, it's always a certain danger uh, involved uh, with that if you just give sensitive client information to untrusted third parties, right? That's something to keep in mind. <coughs> I just wanted to make a point about uh, something that Jay has said, that the uh, early uh, enthusiasts and adopters uh, back in 2010 were primarily uh, libertarian in their views. Uh, but as we can see that um, the community is growing, it's probably way more than you know, one million people, probably way more, um, and it's growing by, by, by the day. Um, and more and more people are getting on this bandwagon and more and more of those people are actually coming from financial background, um, such as banks, and they're trying to regulate. And of course, they're used to KYC and they need KYC because there is regulation in place, and so on and so forth. I guess what I'm trying to say is that, yes, of course, the early adopters uh, have you know, uh, huge war chests, right? They, they, they can splash uh, uh, the, their money on this ICO or that ICO and so on and so forth. But 
Ali actually was really looking for those whales to invest into their uh, projects, or are they looking to actually get the communities, huge communities, which can contribute, I don't know, $10 worth of uh, cryptocurrency to this or that project. They're actually after the network effect, right? So I think that this KYC, we will see that KYC, again, because of the sheer nature that these uh, new ICOs are going to be launched through platforms. The platforms will have KYC inbuilt in them, so we will see a lot more of uh, uh, KYC uh, in volume times, uh, in volume terms. Sorry. Um, so yeah, j just a, um, an observation, and also to to my uh, colleague to to the right, uh, you mentioned that uh, you know the teams have to to be responsible, and I heard the real pain in that. It, can, can you share your experience? I mean, have you run into any teams that were not uh, responsible personally, or uh, are you referring to the uh, penis story and whatever, the Lambo stories? So, you know, so there are so many stories not out there. The, yeah, not the penis stories, but sort of, let's say, we are quite well connected, with, let's say, with the, with the ICO community, and let's say, yeah, so we, we know that some teams are actually really good, I mean, and they, 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 uh, they really, you know, put all the efforts towards uh, developing good projects. The other teams, once they raise the ICO, that's their prize. You know, so that is, uh, we have many cases like, well, we have cases like that. And when we say, uh, when you say we, who's we? Huh? You, you say we have, uh, you mean the community or? Yeah, or, the or community. community. Well, in, in terms of coming back, uh, just to finish up the subject okay. uh, with okay. KYC, okay. it's really, uh, yes, there will be some offerings and services that use it, but it will be always it has to be always only where there are either, uh, where there's a regulated use involved, which means fiat at some point that uh, uh, there's uh, raised, something's raised in fiat or the exchanges, centralized exchanges or securities. Uh, so anything else, uh, KYC in a, in, in a pure coin or pure token scenario uh, is now illegal. So that's, that constrains the use of, of KYC. And also in terms of the, the again, the, the community you mentioned in terms of investors, uh, it's it's two different worlds, really, and I think that's where we are seeing, seeing this bifurcation, unregula regulated and unregulated world, because uh, there's the, the crypto, the original crypto community also has grown, and it sticks to its principles, so we will see uh, KYC. It's a form of uh, censorship, I would argue, and uh, that's where censorship resistant decentralized systems coming in. We're seeing it with exchanges now that have been heavily hit by, by regulatory um, by, uh, requirements and they are, they are just decentralizing it. Now we are seeing uh, this new wave of decentralized exchanges, very successful by the way, and it's really the future of exchanges and we'll see this with many other uh, uh, types of, of platforms as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for everything. <coughs> I think this is, we should give an opportunity to audience um, to ask any questions. Um, from, from, from the guys like you have a massive experience. So anyone has got any questions? I think we should be asking questions to the audience. Uh, where is that? Do we have a mic? Yeah. Just at the back, please. Thank you. Uh, this is really a very interesting discussion, um, but it seems very black and white, either regulate or do not regulate. Do you think there's space for, you know, an evolving area of regulation, like for a new asset class or a new class of rights for tokens? And perhaps there is an area for self-regulation. What do you think? Yeah. Um, well, maybe I'll take that one. Yeah. So I'm, no, I think you're, you're absolutely uh, spot on with the question. Um, and in fact, um, at the moment, uh, and maybe I'll speak for Singapore as a jurisdiction, uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore has basically um, uh, said that they, they will not, uh, they haven't said anything, but they've implied that um, security tokens would not be welcomed, um, utility tokens are welcome, and how you structure the economic interest, um, they'll um, basically let you do that on your own. 
Um, so it allows you to find a way uh, to kind of self self regulate. Um, but I think the issue is going to be uh, not today um, because we're at the, really at the uh, inception of this whole process. Um, but after we have um, a big loss um, of um, of money to the general public, um, then I think we'll see uh, maybe some more severe um, uh, sanctions from the regulators uh, coming in. One question on the VC side, because right, these guys are sitting in the position of VCs, because we have a panel later on on the regulatory side, and I'll welcome you guys to ask as many questions as you can, but just wanted to have a one final question from you guys, wanted to ask for VC. Uh, hi, so um, uh, you guys have experience uh, with uh, institutional investment in uh, ICO projects, so how would you, what is the, uh, perfect uh, structure of uh, institutional fund investment investing in ICOs. Is it open-ended, closed fund, and how it works? I know there are some cases where even funds have um, um, they have like open un, uh, open-ended structure with their own security token, uh, which is then uh, traded on market. So maybe you, you you have experience with such cases, and you can comment. I would encourage funds to answer. <laughs> well, I mean, we are, we are a pure uh, token fund, so we are a private fund, so we are in a in a s somewhat special situation here. So I think uh, uh, it's a question I would rather uh, refer to to someone. Okay, yeah, maybe I'll just take a, a crack at this one as well. Um, actually, uh, we're in the process of launching the D1 coin, which is an asset-backed token backed by diamonds. So in that process, um, I've spoken to about 100 of the um, uh, uh, funds, uh, crypto funds, um, uh, in 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 the market, um, and for the most part, um, they're issuing open-ended uh, funds um, that have um, an administrator, um, sort of a custodian, um, and are uh, exempted under uh, regulation. Um, and there seems to be no shortage of interest um, from small-scale institutions uh, and family offices. I would say mostly family offices that are coming in to write checks for five, uh, ten, maybe twenty million dollars. Um, for these types of funds. Um, and many of them have, have now crossed the $500 million mark. I think some of them are probably approaching in on a billion. Um, and just from, from anecdotally, from the funds that um, I started talking to in November, uh, who had maybe 10 million, a lot of them are above 100 million today. So clearly that money is not coming from, from retail. Uh, it's coming from uh, institution and ultra high net worth. Yeah, I, I would uh, somewhat agree you have to distinguish between actual institutional investors and uh, family offices and ultra high networks. Those are very different for those. So the, the, the word out there is that, that well, uh, institutional investors are only, uh, only have appetite for securities uh, tokens. Yes, the big institutional guys, absolutely. Um, but family offices, it looks very different. Ultra high networks, very different. They are open to, to non-securities tokens very much. It's just a matter of educating them. Many of them are very new to the token space. They still uh, have to wrap their heads around it. You have to, to use terms that they are familiar with. They're very conservative and risk adverse, which means you have to, to really uh, put them at ease, so to speak. For them, it's the wild, wild west. Uh, and they don't, they, you have to explain what's the coin, what's the token, how does it work. But once they start to understand it, then they want to get in on the game. And they are definitely, for them, uh, security tokens are, uh, uh, utility tokens are just as, as attractive as uh, security tokens. I would argue maybe even, even more. And there are, I mean, there are reasons for that I could get in, in detail. Darren, you as an investor, <laughs> I mean, you're definitely not an institutional fund, but you're somehow a private investor. Uh, what's your opinion? I, I don't know. I, I think that, um, uh, first of all, there is no uh, sort of uh, single solution because it all depends on particular institution, right? And it's uh, how, how they approach the space. Um, I've been uh, uh, involved with um, a regular VC fund uh, in United Kingdom uh, for ages now. Uh, and and I, I've been sort of nagging since 2013 that they should uh, start investing into crypto. And they were like, nah, it's too early, it's too early, it's too early, it's too early. But uh, about a month ago, they said, well, we are raising our third fund. And uh, in the um, uh, mandate, they, they, they have uh, uh, included tokens. And I'm like, thanks, God. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so so it's, it, it, it is all, uh, very individual. It, uh, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. 
so do we have time for the last question from the audience? Ah, okay. Okay, so uh, we have to somehow to wrap up because uh, someone is going to miss the flight otherwise. Uh, so just a few words, like if you were advising an ICO uh, right now, you know, what would you advise them? What types of tokens would you advise them to choose? I would tell them stay away from any regulated territory from securities. Uh, and there are, by the way, there are other, other um, regulatory bodies in the US that in other regulation, regulatory frameworks that you want to watch out for in securities. It's not just uh, defined by the how it has, there's much more to it. It depends on the structure of the offer, offering, how you how you really uh, uh, advertise your offering, the language you are using if you're talking about investors, investments, anything that resembles an investment contract, for example. You want to avoid that language. You want to have uh, multiple um, uh, safety nets against regulated territory. So the best thing is exclusion plus also in terms of conveying the nature of your offering and your tokens to be on the safe side. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, um, I would say, uh, you know, in a sentence, um, uh, issue a utility token, uh, but document yourself like a security token. Rakas. So both, uh, both type of tokens could work, securities and utilities. Just make sure that you use the funds uh, carefully and responsibly and because there are legal risks. I mean, if you raise some money and, and, and in the end, when your token value will go to zero, I mean, the party might be over. So be very careful with the, with the money that you raise. Thank you, Darren. Uh, my advice is uh, not about tokens. My advice is about lawyers. Hire good lawyers. Uh, and good accountants. That's, uh, that, that should keep you uh, out of jail. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you, dear panelists. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. You've been fantastic. <laughs> thank you. 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 Thank you.